Amen. Keep your place there in Proverbs 23. We're going to be moving around the book of Proverbs all night tonight, so just prepare to stay in Proverbs. We'll go to other places, but what we're going to talk about tonight is alcohol and the subject of being a drunkard and alcohol in the Bible, what the Bible says about alcohol, what the Bible says, you know, how we should um, look at alcohol as, as saved believers, and, you know, what, just basically, what is the teaching that the Bible has about alcohol, okay? Now, in Proverbs 23, um, we see some verses there about alcohol. We'll get to those in a minute. But first, I want to ask the question, you know, is wine in the Bible alcohol? You know, there's this big question, and people that, you know, people that drink will come up with all kinds of excuses out of the Bible that, oh, you know, so-and-so drank, and, you know, Jesus turned water into wine, and all this kind of stuff. But the bottom line is that I want to show to you, first of all, in the Bible, that wine in the Bible is both alcoholic in some cases and non-alcoholic in other cases. Wine, of course, is, you know, the fruit of the vine. It's the juice that comes from a grape, and it can be either fermented or not fermented. And if you look down at Proverbs 23 that we just read, let me read the first few verses there. And the Bible says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. So we see that there's a mixed wine here. It's a, a, a different kind of wine. It's an adjective put before wine. And then in verse number 31 we see, Look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. So when he says, don't look upon the wine when it is red, when it moveth itself awry, or when it moveth itself aright, it, it, that implies that there is a time when you could look at wine, when wine would be okay, and that when wine is not fermented. That's the fermenting process that the Bible is teaching here, when it moves itself aright. When liquid or uh, juice or whatever kind of liquid is being fermented, whether that be beer or wine, it's, there's something, uh, there's a form of yeast or hops added to it, and it creates a fermenting process, which creates carbonation, which moves the liquid. That's what it's talking about here. It gives its color in the cup. And of course, the color, when it's red, that's referring to the skin of the grape, which contains that yeast that they use to ferment the wine. So there is a wine that is not to be looked upon, and then there is a wine that is okay, which is just unfermented fruit juice in this case. Okay? So sometimes no, sometimes yes. So this, Proverbs 23, is clearly talking about alcoholic wine and alcoholic beverage. Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel 25. Let me give you an example of something in the Bible where it's very likely not alcoholic. 1 Samuel 25. In 1 Samuel 25, we see the story of David and his men. They are running from uh, King Saul. They are hiding from King Saul. And they come across a man, a very a rich man. He's got a lot of sheep, and he's got these people in the wilderness where David and his men are, and they're shearing sheep. And David and his men, they need food and water. They're, they need supplies. You know, they're, they're on the run. They're in hiding. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 25, starting in verse number 10, the Bible says, and Nabal, so basically, David has his men go to da uh, Nabal's sheep shears and ask them for support, for food and drink, okay? And we see Nabal's answer in verse number 12, and Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is David and who is the son of Jesse? It's like, there be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. He's saying, who are you? You're some rebellious servant, and I'm supposed to give you my, my goods, is what he's telling David. Then I, then I shall take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I not know whence they be. He's basically saying, should I take my bread and my water, my drink? Should I give you food and drink? I don't even know who you are just because you rebelled against, you know, the king. He's basically saying, I'm not going to help you. Of course, the story then goes that um, David, you know, basically, you know, this is another, you know, story of, of just a man that's just going to take care of business because David basically goes back to his men. His men tell him this, and he's like, put your swords on. Let's go. And they had helped these men. They had helped these sheep shears. They had taken nothing from them, and this guy was basically insulting them. And then we see um, down a few verses, we see the Bible says, then Abigail, this is Nabal's wife, she understands what's about to happen. 
And she, said, and she is a very wise woman because she is going to stop the slaughter of, of her husband and all these men. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine. I want you to just forget about the two bottles of wine for a minute and just look at how much food she is taking. 200 loaves, two bottles of wine, and five sheep ready dressed, and five measures of parched corn, and an hundred clusters of raisins, and 200 cakes of figs, and laid them on asses, on these donkeys. She, she's bringing a lot of food here. Now these were not bottles of wine like this, like you see in the grocery store, two little bo alcoholic bottles of wine. These were vats of wine that she was taking to these men. It was the drink that was to go along with this food. Now, anybody that knows anything about the, the science of alcohol, alcohol is a diuretic. They couldn't, she couldn't have just given them alcoholic wine because they, they, couldn't have, they couldn't have gotten sustenance from that. This must have been fruit juice to, to sustain them in the wilderness. Okay, that's what Nabal was referring to when he said, should I give you, you know, my bread and my water? She was giving them bread and water, basically. And you could see how much she was giving them, okay? Now, so we see that wine, I mean, I could go on and on and on, and there's a hundred, there's a hundred or more references of wine in the Bible, and I was thinking, should I go through these and say, this one's alcohol, this one's not, and this one's alcohol, and this one's not? But here's the thing. It doesn't really matter in the Bible. And I'm going to show that to you why, why now. Okay? So you see, I just want to prove to you from the Bible that there is non-alcoholic wine, fruit juice, that's called wine in the Bible, and then there's alcoholic wine in the Bible. Okay? But here's the thing. It doesn't matter. And here's three reasons that the Christian shouldn't drink alcohol. Right here. Okay? Turn to Proverbs 31. The first reason is this. Alcohol is not for kings and priests. Period. If you go to Proverbs 31, just a few chapters over from where you were at, and look down at verse number 3. Look down at verse number 3. It's not for kings and priests. It's very clear. None at all. In Proverbs 31, and verse number 3, the Bible says, Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for the prince's strong drink. This is referring to an alcoholic wine. She's, you know, for the prince's strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto them that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Now, kings and princes are not to drink wine, not to drink alcohol. That's what she says. And then she says, give strong drink unto them that is ready to perish. Well, who are those people? Turn to John 10. John chapter 10 in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And let's look at this word perishing. And what does it mean to perish? And why is she saying, give strong drink unto them that are ready to perish, that is ready to perish? Look at John 10 in verse number 28. And this is Jesus talking, and Jesus says this. He says, and I give unto them eternal life, for they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In John 3.16, we all know it, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the Bible says, and I'll often mention this to people soul winning, when Jesus says you will never perish, or you will, never, uh, you will not perish, or you will not perish, he's, he's saying you will never get that second death. You will never go to hell. That's the promise that you're getting from the Lord Jesus Christ in these two verses and many other verses. So those who are ready to perish, those are people that are they're just they're lost. They, they're, not, they're not interested in, in getting saved. They're lost. They're, they're just going to get that second death. And unfortunately, that's a lot of people out there. But that's what Proverbs 31 is referring to. Give to them that are perishing. It's not for you, O Lem Lemuel. You're a king. You're a prince. It's not for kings and princes. But what about us, right? Let's look at one more. Go to Leviticus 10.9. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, first book of the Bible. <clears throat> Leviticus is not the first book of the Bible, but Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus in the beginning of your Bible. Let's look at um, some rules for priests in the Old Testament. And of course, Proverbs is in the Old Testament as well. In Leviticus chapter 10 and verse number 9, 
we see a rule for the priests of God, for the Levitical priesthood. And the Bible says this. The Bible says, Do not drink wine or, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation. Lest ye die, it shall be a statute for, forever throughout your generations. So you say, okay, but they can drink as long as they're not going into the tabernacle, right? We'll get to that. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. The end of the Bible. Go to Genesis and turn 65 books forward and you'll be in Revelation. I've always wanted to make that joke and it wasn't worth it. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1. So we see that kings, princes, kings, and priests are not to drink alcohol. And then there's a specific verse in Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 9 where it says, do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee when you go into the tabernacle, tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. Pretty serious commandment there. Okay, Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are, which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is, faithful, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, we in the, Old, in the New Testament are described as kings and priests. Okay? Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, just a few books backwards from Revelation. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, the Bible reads. I'm just, I just want to build a basis here before we really get into the sermon, okay? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, the Bible reads this. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, there's this doctrine in the New Testament called the priesthood of the believer. We are priests. And the same rules that apply to the priest in the Old Testament apply to us regarding alcohol. We are not to drink. We are to be sober. That's a whole other thing. Now, in 1 Corinthians, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And let's look at one more thing on, on doctrine here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse number 19. And you remember how it said in Leviticus 10, 19, that drink, do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou or nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation. I want to show you one more interesting thing here. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse number 19, the Bible says this, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that lives in you as the believer. Amen. So, you are the priest, and the symbolism is this. The priest, before he could go into the tabernacle of the congregation, was not to drink alcohol, or he would die. The Bible said God would strike them down. or He, would, he was to be killed at that point if he did that. But... We are, we are priests as believers, the New Testament teaches. And the, the temple, there is no temple right now. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And that temple is your body. So, do you think that you should put alcohol in the temple and in the priest at the same time? Obviously not, right? So this is the teaching that the, the first thing is that we're kings and priests. You should not drink alcohol as a, as a believer, period. All right? Now, the Bible also, my second point is the Bible also says over and over and over again, be sober. To be sober means you're of a sound mind. Titus chapter 2 and verse 2, I'll just read for you. The Bible says that the aged men, aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, the Bible's talking about pastors, 
about men that would be a pastor. What's the qualification for a pastor? It says, a bishop, which is interchangeable with the word pastor, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. So look, there, there is no teaching in the Bible that says that the Christian should have any alcohol, period, at all. Amen. Okay, Whether or not one verse talks about an alcoholic wine or not, it makes no difference. You, as a believer, should abstain from alcohol. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Now let's look at, look at some, uh, go back to Proverbs 31. Let's just look at some pragmatism here. And let's look at just what the Bible is teaching that alcohol will do to you. And alcohol will, you know, now let me convince you that alcohol is bad. And I understand that I'm preaching to the choir here. And, but, you know, let's, we, let's go through what the Bible teaches on this. Proverbs 31. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says this, Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Turn back to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. The first point I want to make on you know, alcohol and what the Bible teaches about it is that you will do and say stupid things. That's what the Bible teaches. In Proverbs 23 that we read, in verse number 23, the Bible says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. You will do and say things that you normally would not do. And the Bible is teaching here that this will be a cause of fornication, adultery. It, it takes your judgment away. It perverts your judgment. You shall utter perverse things and do perverse things. Period. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 20. Look, we all know this is true. Anybody who's, who's lived uh, you know, in this world unfortunately knows that alcohol is a terrible perversion of, of a person's judgment. And anybody that has done, you know, many people that do stupid things do it when they're drunk or when they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Look at 1 Kings chapter 20. The, first, the second point I want to make uh, as far as like what the Bible teaches that alcohol will do to you is it will turn you into a prideful idiot as well. Look at 1 Kings chapter 20. Here we see a story of King Ahab. This is before King Ahab got into all the trouble um, with uh, the vineyard and God uh, was upset at him and cursed him. But Ahab is under attack by this man called Ben-Hadad, who's the king of Syria. Ben-Hadad comes at him with these 32 kings. This massive army comes at Ahab. And he's, he's basically demanding that Ahab just give him everything, including his wives and his children, all his possessions. Just surrender, is what Ben-Hadad is saying. And if you look down at 1 Kings chapter 20, in verse number 14, we'll start reading. The Bible says this. And Ahab, the, basically, the princes came to him and said, hey, let's fight. Let's fight this guy. And Ahab said, by whom? And he said, thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. These are the princes of the northern kingdom of Israel. Then he said, who shall order the battle? And he answered, thou. You will order the, the battle. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were 232. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being 7,000. There was only 7,000 of them. Okay? And they went out at noon. So these 7,000 men go out to face an army of hundreds of thousands. The Bible doesn't tell us how many, but it's hundreds of thousands. And they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad, the king on the other side, was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the 30 and 2 kings that helped him. He was so confident, he was so arrogant, he was ordering the battle as he was drunk, as he was drinking himself drunk with all the leaders of the Syrian army. Then jump down to verse number 27 for sake of time. And you see the Bible says here, And the children of Israel were numbered, and were all present, and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. They looked like just two little flocks of sheep. But the Syrians filled the whole country. Just imagine that picture. But there came a man of God, and spake unto the king of Israel, Ahab, and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is the God of the hills. But he is not a God of the valleys, therefore I will deliver all this great multitude into thine hand. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So a prophet comes to Ahab and he says, I am going to deliver this whole host into your hand. And then you will know that I am the Lord. You, Ahab, will know that I am the Lord. Now, just a side note here. This reminds me a lot of when Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, was talking, was asking God 
to heal him of his infirmities. He had, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, the Bible said, and he asked God, take this away from me. Paul said he prayed three times. And God, you know, basically said no. But God said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. You see, he decided not to heal Paul because he felt Paul was stronger towards him and his strength was made stronger in Paul with Paul having that infirmity. The Bible, God all the time in the Bible uses weak people to do great things just to show his power. Amen. You see? You see, if this, this is a, a side sermon here, but the point is that if this would have been an army of 500,000 um, of, of the children of Israel against a 200,000 Syrian army, and they would have won a great battle, you know, a person could have said, well, you know, we just had more people. But here you had 7,000 people. And look in verse number 29. And the Bible says, and they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day, so they camped against each other for seven days. And the seventh day they came together in battle. And the children of Israel, so how do I know that the army was so big? on the Syrian side. Well, right here it is. And the children of Israel slew of the Syrians 100,000 footmen in one day. So you've got 100,000 men fall on the Syrian side, and the, the, the Israelites only had 7,000. You know, do the math on that. Each man killed like 15 people. It's pretty impressive. So, back to the original point, Ben-Hadad was drunk and it turned him into a prideful idiot and ended up getting a hundred thousand people killed is what happened you know he he found himself on the wrong side of god but he was he was very prideful and he was foolish go back to proverbs go back to proverbs 20. proverbs chapter 20 and verse number one alcohol will make you a fool period the bible says wine is a mocker Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So first of all, if you drink alcohol, you're stupid. You're not wise. It's not a wise thing to do. And wine will make a fool of you. That's what it means when it says wine is a mocker. So who wants to be made a fool of? It's crazy that so many people drink when you look at what the Bible actually says. Wine will make you a fool. Now look, look I want to take a few minutes and look at American culture. For, for a few minutes here and talk about you know what what the world is telling us about alcohol and what's actually true and what the Bible teaches about alcohol and once again you've heard me say it before it's not a little bit different it's exactly the opposite you know now uh, you know just here's another confession for you I'm not someone who's never had a drink before in my life I wish I could say that I was I've heard many pastors stay up, st stand up behind the, the pulpit and say, I've never even drunk a beer before. I wish that was me. But, but it wasn't. I was raised in a culture of, you know, where alcohol was considered okay, when it was considered, you know, fine. And that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. We have this John Wayne culture in this country. We certainly did when I was growing up. That if you want to be a tough guy, if you do these things like, like these, if you do these men things, and this, this always bothered me. If you do all these men things, especially, I shouldn't say it always bothered me. Once I had kids, it started to bother me. That all these manly things that we did, whether it was hunting or fishing or whatever, alcohol was always part of it. And that's the culture in America. That's the culture I grew up in in the upper Midwest. And it's absolutely false. You know, the truth of it is, you know, the truth of it is this. If you look at, you know, is, is alcohol manly? Does it make you a man? I, I did a little bit of research on this, and here's some, uh, some facts for you. The Bible, or not the Bible, but just secular science says this. Al alcohol use affects all three parts of the hypothalamic pituitary gonagal HPG axis, a system of endocrine glands and hormones involved in male reproduction. Alcohol use is associated with low testosterone and altered levels of addiction, additional reproductive hormones. Researchers are investigating several potential mechanisms for alcohol's damage. So basically, alcohol lowers your testosterone. There's many other studies I could read you on how alcohol metastasizes into estrogen, and you literally become less of a man the more you drink, is what it turns, you know, what it turns out to. Alcohol, 
you know, ups the, uh, the production of cortisol in your body, which causes you to have fat around your midsection and once again lowers your testosterone even more. You know, this is not something that a, a real tough guy would want to happen to him. Now here's something that's really interesting, and I've known this for a while, but here's something that's really interesting, and I'm starting to see this more and more as well. But in a 2007 study in the Journal of Clin Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, it revealed that a substan there is a substantial drop in the United States men's testosterone levels since the 1980s. Now listen to this. If you haven't heard this, this is shocking. This might ruin your day. With average levels declining by about 1% per year. This means, for example, that a 60-year-old man in 2004 had testosterone levels 17% lower than those of a 16 60-year-old man in 1987. Another study of Danish men produced similar findings with double-digit declines among men born in the 1960s compared to those born in the 1920s. Translation, you are literally half the man that your grandfather was. That's, that's what it boils down to. Now there's a lot of uh, dietary and sedentary, you know, that men are not doing physical work anymore and all this, but do you think you need to speed the process up by drinking alcohol? I mean, that's part of it. That's definitely part of it because drinking um, among certain areas of the population is, is going up as well. Now, on the contrary to this tough guy culture that we have in the United States, you think of the men in the Bible who were drinking or who were drunk. Just think of it. I mean, we could go through all of them, but I'll just give you uh, a few examples. Lot. He got drunk and ended up having, you know, having children with his own daughters when he was drunk. It's disgusting. Men in the Bible who were drunk did perverse things. They got taken advantage of. Noah exposed his nakedness to Ham. You know, they caused thousands of people to die like we saw with Ben-Hadad. He wasn't paying attention to what was going on and God crushed his army right before his drunken eyes. Okay? Here's another thing. It, change, it literally changes your brain, alcohol, over time. And I've seen this personally with people that I know. Here's another scientific uh, quote. Once the brain adapts to the alcohol, it does not unadapt. When alcoholics stop drinking, many of these changes continue to be a problem throughout their whole lives. I have known men who were old men that did not drink as, as long as I knew them, but they were heavy drinkers early in their life, and they were just, they were, they had this temperament, they would just snap at an instant, and it was because of their drinking earlier in their life. It changed their brain. It changed who they are. So you think it's a harmless drug, it's something that's harmless, it is absolutely not. We met, here's a really interesting story. My wife and I, my wife knocked on the door of a lady about a year ago. And this lady, and this is a great story on so many different levels, but this lady, she asked her if she knew she was going to heaven, and she said, oh yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. And she asked how, and just faith in Jesus Christ, and I've you know, trusted in the Lord, and I'm saved. Is, do you think there's anything you could ever do to lose that salvation? She's like, she's like, no. No, there's not. Of course not. She's like, I'm not sure why, she said, but no, you can't, I could never lose it, she thought. So Heidi in, in, invites her to church. We get her contact information, and church the next day, we drive to pick this lady up. We go to pick her up, we knock on the door, and she doesn't know who we are. She has no idea. We have to explain, hey, we're, we were here yesterday. Uh, we're from Verity Baptist Church. Oh, oh, uh, would you like to come? Yeah, I'd like to come. She's living. Her house was a disaster. We were, I felt so bad that this lady was living by herself because we went into her house and we're like, man, maybe she's dead or something. We didn't know. And she, she was hollering from a back room. We went in. We found her. And we brought her to church. At the end of church, we asked her, are you ready to go home? Who are you? She forgot who we were by the end of church. She had, we talked to her neighbors, we took her home, we went and talked to her neighbors as somebody taking care of this lady. We're actually concerned about her well-being at this point. We talked to her neighbors, her neighbor, um, we found a neighbor lady who was kind of looking over her. Her children had pretty much abandoned her. She had burned um, several bridges in her life, I guess, but she had alcohol dementia, is what the neighbor told us. But isn't it interesting that after she forgot everything, that God kept that one thing in her mind? That's the interesting thing to me. It's a great proof of eternal security, first of all, and the power of the gospel, and the power of God, 
God's ability to keep His promise. And he decided she ruined her whole life. She drank her, whole, she drank her brain away. But not only did God keep His promise to her, but He kept that knowledge in her mind as well, which is a beautiful thing. So, now, let's look at a couple other things here. Turn to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. We'll go here. There's so much we could say on this. <clears throat> Turn to Isaiah 28, and then we'll get into some application here in your lives. Isaiah 28. And the Bible says, I mean, there's so much Bible uh, on, on this. Let's just look at Isaiah 28 in verse number 7. And the Bible says, But they have also erred through wine and through strong drink. They also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. So here we have the priest and the prophet drinking. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all the tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. You know, that's where drinking will bring you, into vomit and filthiness. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, and precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. Who is going to teach and preach in your home if you are turned into a stammering fool, basically? And so many things, so many things will be destroyed, um, for, especially for the Christian, if they drink. Now, turn to Romans chapter 6. Let's look at some application. And I, I don't know, as far as I know, nobody even drinks in here, but let's look at, you know, if you do drink, let's look at how to quit drinking and what the Bible says about that. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and start ver in verse number 12. And the Bible says this, it says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of the righteousness unto God. Now skip down a couple verses to, to verse number 17. It says, But God be thanked that ye were, ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. The gospel was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So it switched on you. You're no longer the servants of sin. Now you're the servants of righteousness. And if you continue to sin, you become a slave to sin. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, the beauty of verse 18, it says you can be made free from sin. So the Bible, said, the Bible teaches that with you and the Holy Spirit as a saved person, you have the ability to overcome sin in your life. So you can't make the excuse, oh, I just can't stop. No, that's not, that's not true. If you drink, just stop drinking. I know that sounds simple, but it is simple. What you do is the next time you're going to drink, you just don't ever again because you don't have to be a slave to that anymore. Alcohol and drugs will enslave you. Californians, listen to me. You have examples of this every single day. You look at all these people out here. These people are totally and completely enslaved to alcohol and drugs. As an usher at Verity Baptist Church, I said, Dozens of times, as we stood out handing out bulletins like you all do this, you know, at this church, we would stand out there, and there was a methadone clinic next door. <coughs> I understand that this isn't alcohol, but you would have these drug addicts walk by and go get this methadone that the government gives them. And I, I would tell the guys, I'm like, all we need to do for these kids in this church is just have them stand here for 20 minutes every single Sunday morning and watch this show. Because it is zombie land. These people are gone. They're gone. And I've tried to talk to them, and I'm sure many of you as soul winners have tried to talk to them. They're done. Their minds are mush. I believe many of them are possessed, like straight up possessed. I mean, we have had them come into church. We had a policy that if you want to come to church and you can sit through a church service, you're welcome to come into church. 
and we have had them start fighting in the church with someone who wasn't there next to them. I mean, there, it's, it's too late. You can get to the point where there's too late. You can get to the point where you've destroyed your brain to the point where you will not be able to understand the gospel if somebody tries to give it to you. You can get there. So some of these people that have pushed it this far, you know, they're going to pay ultimately in hell if they're not saved. Some of these people, if they're saved and then they ruin their lives into that, like that lady, you know, she paid on this earth with, with her body and her mind. She's still going to go to heaven, but she ruined her life. You know, the, the people, we've had them come in, we've had them get um, baptized, we have gotten a couple of them saved, and then, you know, they start stealing from the church or whatever, and they go back into that life. You know, you talk to the families of these people, you know these people standing outside, standing on the corners with signs, you know they very likely have people that know them and that are related to them in their lives, but they've burned every bridge. It was the same way with this specific lady that, that we knew. She was a homeless lady. She got saved. She got baptized. Praise God that she was able to get saved and get baptized, but she went back into that life. But we did meet her family, and they were reluctant to come to her bap baptism because she had just burned those bridges so many times. So many times with her children. So many times with everybody in her family. Look, most people aren't going to take it this far. Okay, these guys, I mean, these folks out here in California have taken it all the way as far as just destroying, burning that thing down, right? But look, the minute your marriage is destroyed, it's, it's too late for your marriage. You know, the minute that your brain is destroyed, it's too late. The minute that your body is destroyed. I know people who drank so much in their life that their body is destroyed. They no longer drink. But the damage is done. It'll destroy your body. Oh, but I just drink a little. In all my time growing in my, all the way through my 20s, for 30 years of my life, the guy, you know the guy that has a beer once every two weeks and never overdoes it? I never met him one time. He doesn't exist. Not where I come from, anyway. So that's a bunch of garbage. People say, oh, you know, in moderation. No, even people drink in moderation. Sometimes they, they overdo it occasionally. And then bad things happen. I've, I've never met that guy. Look, it's selfish. It's vain. It's something you do to make yourself feel good. And you just end up making a fool of yourself. And God, God's going to punish the Christian for it too. That's another thing. We could get into the, the chastisement of God side of it as well. So, you, need to, you just need to be done with it. You just need to, be, to stop drinking. That's the easy part. But here's the second thing. You need to stop hanging around it. Alright? And this is especially important for you people with families. And extended families. And I don't know, this is a big deal. Look, first of all, it's irritating. Who wants to be around a bunch of... You ever been around a bunch of people drinking? It's the, one of the most irritating things that could ever happen to you, in my opinion. I can't, I can't stand it. You know, you need to change your culture. You need to stop going to these things. We stopped going to all kinds of things. And we didn't care who we offended. And we offended a lot of people. Amen. A lot of people that we were related to, we offended. But I don't care. Because I am not going to put my family in a situation where we make this sin less sinful to them. Okay? Look, they don't like it anyway. A bunch of people who are drinking, they don't like somebody that doesn't drink being around them. You know why? You, you want to you find out who your friends aren't? Stop drinking. You'll find out who your friends aren't. Because you know what drinking buddies are? Drinking buddies are a bunch of idiots sitting around validating each other's lifestyles. That's all it is. They don't care about the other person. They don't care about anything about you. you just, we're just validating each other's sin. That's it. Because if you do it and I do it, there must be nothing wrong with it. It's stupid, but it's true. Look, it will be, turn to Habakkuk. In the Minor Prophets, in the back of the Old Testament. Turn to Habakkuk. Look, it will be extremely, you say, I'm not going to drink. There's no way I'd ever drink again. Good for you. But it'll be extremely damaging to your kids, and I want to show you that now. 
In Romans chapter 7, I'll read this to you while you're turning to Habakkuk. Romans chapter 7, verse 13. Was then that was, which is made good death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear, sin working death in me that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. If you hang around people that drink and your kids see you hanging around people that drink and going to events where there's drinking and seeing people drink that they know and that they love especially, it will make that sin not sinful to them. They will, they will not take it seriously. If they see their relatives, their uncles, all these different cousins, whatever, drinking, it will, oh, dad doesn't drink, but uh, cousin uh, Joe drinks and he's a super nice guy. No, it will make that sin less sinful to them and it puts them in danger, folks. Look, we saw a drunk driver just last night. The guy was driving this pickup weaving all over the road. I mean, we're, I mean, if we would have had to bet, we'd bet that guy would have gotten an accident last night just because we saw him driving down the freeway that way. We knew a lady who my wife was very good friends with. We were neighbors with them. And her husband, she was the nicest lady in the world. Christian, I, I don't know if she's saved or not, but just the, the, the softest hearted lady you'd ever meet. Her husband was this guy who would have a beer in his hand by 8.30 in the morning. This guy drank a six-pack of those tall beers on his way home from work every single night. This was who he was. And you know, I remember what she said one day to my wife. She said, because she didn't drink at all. And this guy was just a, he was just, a, he was a drunk. And I remember it was so sad and it just kind of tattooed into my brain. But she said one day, she said, I just know that one day it will ruin both of our lives. Because one day he's going to get in an accident, or he's going to kill somebody, or he's going to kill himself, or he's going to... And, by the way, that has come true. Because, and I won't tell the story, but he's basically deep six their whole life. That man, because of alcohol. It's very sad. I know people who have gambled away their whole life savings in one day. I've heard of these friends of friends of relatives in one day because of alcohol. They'll give you alcohol for free at the casino. It's, it's terrible. Look down at Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunk also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Now first of all, this is a couple of dudes that we're talking about. It's two guys, and one of them is trying to take advantage of the other guy. So we're seeing just once again some homo trying to, you know, be a predator on somebody. I mean, how many examples in the Bible do we need about this? I mean, preached a whole sermon on this. I, I, there's so many verses I didn't even go here. But the Bible says that there's predators out there that will use alcohol to take advantage of people. All right. Did you go to that? You remember when I talked to you about that website that shows all those predators in everybody's neighborhood? I mean, those people are everywhere. At least 50% of student sexual assaults involve alcohol. 90% of rapes perpetrated by an acquaintance of the victim involve alcohol. It's a tool. It's a tool. You know, this, this is a secular study. Here. In a lot of these studies I read, these were like, like groundbreaking studies in the last 10 years. Wow, we have found a connection with sexually transmitted diseases and alcohol. And somebody wrote a paper on it. You know, are you kidding me? The, look, just read the Bible. I mean, we have found a connection between risky behavior and alcohol. Somebody's speaking at an international conference about that. I mean, just read the Bible. The Bible tells you everything you need to know. Look, you need to warn your kids that they're evil people are out there today. Now look, here, here's something for you. You guys go to family events, and you go to all these things, and you prove to your kids that alcohol, you don't drink, but alcohol is not that big of a deal. Then they go to college. And now they grab this thing that isn't that big of a deal. You ever heard of a story of a girl that goes out to a bar and gets taken advantage of and she has too many drinks and then she gets killed and dumped in the ocean? Yeah. 
Do you think that if she wasn't raised in a culture of alcohol, that some sick predator would have had a chance of killing that poor girl? This is how serious it is. This is how serious it is, folks. You know, your adversary, the devil, walketh about like a roaring lion. It is serious business. There's bad people out there. That's why we have to preach the whole Bible. You know, this, it's not just all roses and, and melodies. There's bad people out there who will kill people. You know, they will, they will molest people. They will, they will they'll do terrible, perverted things. And alcohol is a tool that they use. It's not harmless. I don't care. So we don't go to weddings. We don't, if it's there, we're not there. Amen. Period. If, if there's any kind of event where that kind of stuff is there and it can be an influence on my children, we're not there. Amen. And my children, they need to see me drawing those lines. You, you, they're not easy lines to draw. People will get mad at you. But I will put up those walls in my life. And you have to do it, folks. Because your children, they will see. They will, they will understand why you do that. So, you shouldn't be around it at all. Don't even look upon it. Don't even think about it. <clears throat> I, look at these, I look at these parents. I know several kids now under the age of 10 that are being raised in this kind of environment. And it just, it just, straight, up, it just straight up ticks me off. Because it's, it's funny. It's funny when the little kid goes and gets his dad a beer. It's funny to them. But you hear about these things. You hear how it ends when they're 25 and when they're 30. Nobody's laughing then. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Third thing is you should stay away from it because if it's even a temptation from you. And if you've just quit drinking, you know, in the, in the last year or two, look, if you used to drink and, and you have that temptation, look, it's going to go away. It, it just, just don't ever even think about doing it again. It just, it'll just go away. You'll, be, you, you'll just become normal. You know, I mean, if, if you... If you're worried about the social situations where, oh, I go out fishing and I feel like I should, you know, be drinking a beer, just quit fishing. I, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. The Bible says don't even look upon it. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, in verse 22, the Bible also says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So I don't go and sit in a bar. If I can get into the bar at Applebee's 20 minutes earlier, I'm not going to sit in the bar. Period. You know, because we're just going to abstain from all appearance of evil. I don't want to be a bunch, around a bunch of drunk conversations anyway. It's just irritating. And here's another thing, and I've not heard this in this church, okay? So I'm not yelling at anybody, but I'm very serious about this. This is something that many of us in this room have in our past, but here's what we're not going to do. We're not ever going to make light of it here. We're not going to stand in the back and talk about, you know, oh, back in the day or whatever. No, never here. Because we're not going to make light of it. it it's a huge, I, I, you know, I look back, as I'm sure all of you do, it's a huge waste of time in my life. It did nothing positive for me. Nothing. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Let's talk about moving forward. Moving forward. Luke chapter 9. We're never going to make light of sin here. Not just alcohol. So we shouldn't talk about, you know, things of the past, like, you know, we really just shouldn't talk about it. Because it, it makes it something that's, that's casual and that's light. And we don't want, that's not what this is about. This is about looking forward. This is about getting right and looking forward. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 59. The Bible says this, and this is Jesus, and he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Look, unsaved family and drink, look, 
I have I've made great efforts in my family to keep connections so there might be a chance to get people saved if the time presents itself. But let me just reiterate again. There, if there is a situation where some unsaved family, I feel, could influence not just alcohol, any type of worldly situation onto my family where there's that influence that could come in, I have drawn those lines and I've put up those walls. And they'll, they'll offend people and people will be mad. But this is what Jesus taught. Let the dead bury the dead. And then he said, and another said, also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So if you think to yourself, Oh, I've wasted so much time in my life. And you just lament that I've just wasted so much time. And, you know, whether it was because of alcohol or other stupid sin or whatever. You, you just have to use that to help you grip that plow harder. You understand? That, that's what I do. I don't sit here and lament. I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to plow harder now. I wasted some time in my life. But now, I'm going to plow harder than everybody else. Because it's a race. I got some catching up to do. That's the way I look at it. That's how you should look at it too. Don't look back. Jesus said, don't, don't look back. Just grip that plow harder and push it harder. You know, look, if you're here right now in this church, you have not pushed things too, too far in your life to where you can't redeem the time in your life. I can tell you that right now. All right? So grip that plow harder and push forward faster. And I guarantee you, you'll do more for God in your life than the overwhelming vast majority of, of Christians on this earth. Okay? Abstain from alcohol. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and, and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for the law. Lord, we thank you for um, the book of Proverbs. Um, it's, a, it's a book I wish I would have known when I, was, when I was 20 years old, Lord. And I just thank you for the wisdom in, in these books. And I thank you for the entire law and, and just the, how much sense it makes and how, how protective the law is of us, Lord, and how it just shows that you love us, and you're not just here to just, you know, just to control us, but you care about us, and you want us to, to, to have a, a good life, Lord, and not be enslaved by sin in our life. Just help us to be strong, do the right things, and raise our kids in, in the right manner, Lord, and abstain from all these sins, and, and abstain from people that are into these sins, Lord. Um, we thank you for the Bible. Please uh, bless this church and the fellowship to come tonight, Lord. Um, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.